So there's this expression on Wall Street called, um, I don't know if I can say it, it's called fuck you money. Um, And the basic idea is if you have enough money, you can say whatever you want and do whatever you want. I think Donald Trump is maybe a good example of that. It's very interesting the way things work in Washington. You would think if you you had to be (laughs) rescued and someone handed you a half a trillion dollars because you were in so much trouble, you needed that much money that maybe they wouldn't take your phone calls anymore. But um, that's not how it works. (laughs) So there's a lot of different pockets of problems that I see um, in our economy currently that make me nervous. All right, young and naive, we're, uh, are we in Washington? We are, Washington, D.C. This is Capitol Hill? It is. And who are you? Where's the Capitol? (laughs) I'm Alexis Goldstein. I work for Americans for Financial Reform, which is a coalition of groups that advocates for a safer and fairer financial system here in the United States. Why do you do that? Well, I think that after the financial crisis, a lot of people lost their job. A lot of people lost a lot of their wealth. And even though we had um, the passage of a law called the Dodd-Frank Act, which made some progress, I think there's still a lot of work to be done to make sure that we don't have another huge financial crisis like we had in 2008 and to make sure that the economy works for everybody, not just the people at the top. We're going to talk about that in a minute. Uh, Where did you go to school? I went to Columbia University in New York City. And um, after you graduated, do you have any student debt? I did. Yes, I did. Um, A lot of us here in the U.S. have a lot of student debt when we graduate. Um, Yeah. And do you still have that debt? I don't. I'm very fortunate. Um, After I graduated, I went and I worked on Wall Street and I made, I think, a a pretty nice salary compared to your average American. So it didn't I didn't pay it off right away. It actually took me kind of a, a long time, but I did finally eventually pay it off, I think, a year or so ago. How long does it take to, to, to pay off student debt? I mean, it depends. Some people have hundreds of thousands of dollars if they, for example, go to law school. Some people never pay it off. We have programs here where if you pay on time every month for 20 years, they will, uh, the government will cancel your debt. But if you miss even one payment, you're not eligible. Um, if you work in public service, there's a shortened period of debt forgiveness. So you can get it after 10 years if you work in the government or at a nonprofit. But again, you have to make your payments every month on time. If you're late, even once, it, you may not be eligible. So I mean, for, for Germans, it's weird that <laughs> students have debt, like the, that you have to pay for your education. Yeah. Why, why does America still do that? Well, I think there's a couple of reasons. One is that I think it's very profitable for financial institutions to be able to offer debt to consumers instead of having tuition be free, like it is, I think, in in lots of Europe. I think another reason is just that um, we have disinvested in our higher education here. There are a few states that many years ago used to have completely free schools, like in California, like in New York. But um, I don't know if your viewers are familiar with Ronald Reagan. He was the governor of California before he became the president. And one of the things he did as the governor was set about to make sure that um, the colleges in California, he thought they were too powerful and he wanted to um, disinvest in them. And after Reagan, the schools in California were no longer free. So you went to Wall Street after college? I did, yes. Why? Well, at Columbia, part of it is I, that was who recruited at Columbia. There are a lot of Wall Street banks that come and come to the career fairs and say, hey, come and work for us. Um, I had a bunch of debt that I needed to pay off. Also, that's what a lot of my people that were in school a year ahead of me did. That's where I interned. My summer internship was at a company called Morgan Stanley, which is one of the bigger banks here in the U.S. Um, and they gave me an offer and I said, well, let's give it a try. Also, I um, my major was in computer science. And so I thought, well, this is an interesting place to work. There's a lot of technical problems here. Maybe maybe this will be some interesting work. But it's certainly something that um, I didn't set out to do <laughs> when I was a kid, for example. I didn't say, oh, I want to grow up and work on Wall Street. What did you do at Wall Street? So at first I was a computer programmer and I wrote some software that we actually um, gave away to hedge funds. The idea being we give it to them for free, but then when they execute their trades with us, we take a portion of that. We charge them a small fee. Mm-hmm. Um, and then after that, I moved to Merrill Lynch. Um, which no longer exists. It's now Bank of America. During the financial crisis, it uh, was taken over by Bank of America. And there I was um, 
more of a software designer. I kind of went around to the traders and the salespeople and the compliance people and said, what is our internal software that does all of our trading need to do? What records does it need to keep? What features do you want it to have? Um, and then I did that same role at, at Deutsche Bank, actually, was my last job. Well, well, well. <laughs> yeah. Is Deutsche Bank any different than uh, American banks? At the time, it was seen as safer um, because I went to Deutsche Bank after the financial crisis and people said, oh, you know, Deutsche Bank is really well positioned and they didn't have a, as much of this toxic mortgage, mortgage assets. But here we are today and Deutsche Bank has its own, I think, set of problems. So um, I don't know that culturally it was any different. Um, the only real difference I can think about is I think we traveled more and people um, were more interested in going to the different offices, whereas at the American banks that I worked at, it was all, you come to us. New York is the center. So how long uh, did you work for uh, on Wall Street? Uh, seven years, if you add it all up. Mm -hmm. And I was at Deutsche Bank uh, for about a year, I think. So what made you leave? I, every birthday that came and went, I said, well, I don't really know what I'm doing to help the wider world. Didn't really feel like I had any great purpose. I felt like I was um, essentially making wealthy people more wealthy was the sort of task at hand, whether that was through individual private clients or some of the very wealthy firms. Most of our firms were big institutions. Um, and I wanted to do something more meaningful. But isn't banking... Or is banking always about making wealthier people wealthy? Well, it's interesting. So now I work here in D.C. And when banks come to D.C., they say things like, we help move the economy forward and we help average Americans get loans. But that's not how bankers talk or traders, I should say, talk on the trading floor. The way they talk is they say, who's the client? And if the client is someone they think is not that smart, they'll give them a bad price on purpose because they think they can get away with it. And on the trading floor, it's all about, did we win? And if we didn't win, it's because we were too stupid and they were smarter than us. And if we do win, it's because they were too stupid and we beat them and that's awesome. And it's all, it's very cutthroat, it's sink or swim. Nobody thinks they're doing anything to better the world. It's all about making money and you use whatever opportunity you can to do that, even if you're not really being honest with people, right? Maybe I could give you a better price, but I know, I think, you know, that you're a dumb client, so I'm not going to give you the price that is the right price. I'm going to give you a not great price. Are we still sending okay? All right. So what, what does winning mean uh, in banking? Um, the, the, the same as uh, Donald Trump is talking about? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's interesting. He's So there's this expression on Wall Street called, um, I don't know if I can yeah, sure. say it. Sure. It's called fuck you money. Um, and the basic idea is if you have enough money, you can say whatever you want and do whatever you want. I think Donald Trump is maybe a good example of that. Um, but winning is basically... The way that they, I heard them define it is there was an expression called ripping your client's face off. And what that meant was you gave your client a terrible deal where they were either paying way too much or accepting way too little if they were selling, but they thought that they got a huge bargain. And so they were happy and you were happy because you just really ripped them off. That was winning. <laughs> so um, after the financial crisis, we realized there are banks too big to fail. Mm -hmm. Are banks still too big to fail? I think that a lot of people, yes, I think that I, I'm concerned that there are a number of banks that are still too big to fail. There were some changes made to make it more difficult for the government to bail out a single institution, and that's a really important part of Dodd-Frank. But I think if a couple of banks started to go under, or even if just a single bank went under, I think one of the lessons we saw in the financial crisis is the regulators were really willing to pull out all the stops. <laughs> Like, like this wind <laughs> and do whatever it takes <laughs> um, to stabilize the economy. And I think part of the problem is one of the reforms that came about after the financial crisis was a program called Living Wills. And what that means is I have to write a plan every year if I'm a big bank and hand it to the government and say, here's how I could fail without you rescuing me with government money. And if the regulators don't think that those plans are believable or credible, they can actually go in and do things like break them up. But the problem is the regulators haven't taken any actions like that. Every time the banks have submitted the plans, they've said, okay, we'll give you another try. You know, 
kind of like whispering the answers to them, like as if I handed you a homework assignment and you were like, this answer is wrong. Can you change this answer? And can you change this answer? And I go back and change my answers and I give it to you again. And you're like, okay, that's better. But this answer is still wrong. That's sort of how the process has played out. So I do think that there are some banks that are probably still big to fail, too big to fail. We do have tools to address it. The question is whether or not the people in the positions at the regulators are actually going to use the tools that they have now to fix that problem. Is it called a stress test? The stress test is something different oh. um, that they also have to do. Um, that is more about the health of the bank. And they certainly do have um, things that they can do if banks fail the stress test, but breaking them up isn't one of them. But yes, those are sort of two parallel sets of tools that the regulators have. So they have a lot of things that they can do to examine these institutions. Uh, but I think the problem is really that banks and other large companies here in the U.S. have accumulated not just lots of money, but lots of political power. And with great political power, you know, you can kind of throw your weight around. You can scare people about what might happen if you do anything to interfere with their business. And I think that there's a lot of political donations that are flowing to many members of our government um, from these companies. And so and then there are many people that are working at the regulators that like me, used to work on Wall Street or maybe want to go work on Wall Street later. And all of that has sort of an effect of maybe making them less aggressive than they might be otherwise. So tell us, what are the big banks? Which banks are basically too big to fail? Well, I could start with the first question, which is what are the big banks? Right. Um, there's Bank of America, there's Citigroup, there's Morgan Stanley, there's Goldman Sachs, there's Wells Fargo. Um, in terms of which ones are too big to fail, so the reg that process I just explained, that living wills process, um, Wells Fargo failed its last living will, uh, Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs. Um, Citigroup actually passed, which, or not passed, but they said that their living will was credible, which I think is interesting because Citigroup is actually very, very large, and I w would be concerned if it started to fail. There's a lot of people that have their money with Citigroup. So I think that there are a lot of questions about pretty much all of our large banks about whether or not they could, if, could they safely go bankrupt without the government being involved? I'm not so sure. But are there ones there that are too big to fail? Um. I mean, yeah, I think probably all of our large banks are probably still too big to fail. What about Deutsche Bank? Um, I think Deutsche Bank is probably too big to fail in Europe. I'm not sure if Deutsche Bank is too big to fail in terms of like its impact on the United States. I certainly think it could have a knock-on effect on, on U.S. banks. But it does seem as though the, um, there probably will be <laughs> some assistance given to Deutsche Bank if needed. I, I don't want to make too many predictions, but that would be my guess. <laughs> So we're talking about the regulators. Who are these regulators? Are these the congressmen and senators? No. Yeah, no, they um, they are in D.C., just not here. Um, there's a bunch of banking regulators. They cover different areas. So there's um, the, S the Securities and Exchange Commission. We say the SEC for short. They tend to cover um, securities, some kinds of derivatives. Um, and derivatives are like if you have an actual physical thing like some corn, That's an actual product. A derivative is like, I'm going to pay you in three months for that year of corn. Um, so it's a financial product that's derived from an actual thing, but it's not a thing itself. It's like just, a bet? Kind of, yeah. That's a good way to put it. Um, a bet about the future, an option to buy something in the future. So there's a regulator that covers almost all the derivatives, the Commodity Futures Trading Commission. Then there's a bunch of banking regulators. Um, one of them is the Federal Reserve, although they have a dual role. They are a regulator, and then they also oversee interest rates and monetary policy. There's the Office of the Controller of the Currency. They're another banking regulator. They also have people that sit in these large banks um, and have desks there and you know watch what they're doing. There's the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, that's the FDIC for short. And here in the U.S., if um, a bank goes under and you go to the ATM and you can't get your money out, the FDIC is the institution that says up to $250,000, that money that you have in the bank is guaranteed, we'll make sure you get that money back. So it's insurance, essentially, on the money that you deposit in the bank. And then there's one other regulator that's kind of a unique 
new regulator called the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, and it came about after the financial crisis as a part of the Dodd-Frank Act, and they're basically devoted to making sure that consumers are not scammed by their financial companies. And so just recently here in the United States, Wells Fargo was found to have created over 2 million fake accounts for customers that never asked for those accounts, and then they charged these customers fees for the accounts they never asked for. And the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau is right now getting refunds for people who got charged fees on fake accounts. But, but let's stick with uh, Wells Fargo. What, what happens to Wells Fargo if they get caught? Like, do they have to close or? Well, it's been interesting. So they had to pay a um, hundred million dollars to the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Um, I believe 80 or 85 million dollars to two other regulators. Their CEO went before Congress and got asked a lot of tough questions and he has since decided that he's going to retire. Um, however, the person who is now stepping up to become the CEO was also there when this fraud was happening. So we're not really sure if that's that much of an improvement because it's not like they're bringing in somebody who's either brand new and wasn't there when the bad stuff was happening. Um, this is someone who was also had a high level of responsibility at the bank. So Wells Fargo is seeing some response from cities and states who are saying, we no longer trust you. So for example, the city of Los Angeles has a banking program to help people who don't have bank accounts get bank accounts. They said Wells Fargo cannot participate in that anymore. And then here in the US, we do a lot of borrowing, right? We don't like to finance things. So we don't finance higher education or free tuition. We also don't give a lot of money to states. And so states often, individual states in the United States often have to borrow money from banks to build roads or help, you know, repair the school. And some states now, like Illinois and parts of the government in New York have said, we don't want to borrow money from Wells Fargo because of this scandal, because we think what you did was so, was so bad. So they're, they're definitely feeling some pain, but um, they do still exist as a bank. I mean, if they committed fraud, did any did anybody have to go to jail? It's a great question. Um, I think so. The department, so here in the United States, the Department of Justice is the organization that can prosecute, you know, companies essentially for breaking the law and throw them in jail. They are investigating. That's all we know. Um, there is one law that is called Sarbanes Oxley that basically says you can't be the CEO and just say I didn't know what was happening. I didn't know. Um, it basically says you have to sign on a dotted line that there are controls within your company that make sure that everything is right and above board. And if you sign on that dotted line that everything's okay and it isn't, you can you can go to jail for that. So perhaps I don't know what the Department of Justice is going to do, but they could send executives at Wells Fargo to jail for violations of, of that particular law. And there are probably other laws as well, but that's the first one that comes to my mind. I mean, the Wells Fargo fraud is from this year, no. the, the financial... Well, sorry. Ah. So it was discovered this year. Ah. The fraud was between 2011 and 2015. Financial crisis is like, uh, like eight, nine years old. Mm -hmm. uh, did any, I mean, the whole, the crash, uh, crash the whole, world economy, uh, did anybody have to go to jail from any American bank? The only person that I recall who went to jail was actually somebody who stole some code from a bank. So it was actually someone who hurt the bank, not a banker that hurt the public. Really? Um, there were some very small banks that were targeted by the Department of Justice. There was a bank in Chinatown that was very, very small, whose name was Abacus, that um, that did some time, but none of the major financial institutions, no one, none of the executives, none of the CEOs saw any, any prison time or jail Why? time. Well, one of the um, people in uh, the Department of Justice's former, uh, sorry, the former Attorney General of the United States, Eric Holder, said um, essentially that they took into account economic considerations when they were weighing whether or not to prosecute folks. So in other words, the way the media reported that comment that he made was that there were some firms that were too big to jail. Now that was not the exact phrasing that he used, but that was the upshot. And so I think that he, he walked that back very quickly because he got a lot of criticism for it. But I think that, he, uh, that there was truth to what he said at that time. I think that people were concerned at people at the regulators, people at the Department of Justice were concerned that if they took any strong action against the financial companies that that would have an economic impact and they didn't want to risk that.
you agree? No. I think that it's really important that when there is fraud, when people break the law, when companies break the law, that there are consequences for that because otherwise you just engender a culture where there is no accountability. You feel that you can continue to test the limits. You can continue to break the law and get away with it as just and pay some fines perhaps. They call it the cost of doing business. Um, but often the fines will be far less than the profits that you made. And I think that that incentivizes risky behavior and risky behavior is what brought us to the brink I think on the financial crisis is because people were thinking about their bonus at the end of the year they weren't thinking about is this a good long-term investment is this something I I want to be loading up Citigroup for example was a bank that had a lot of really toxic mortgage products um, I think if people were not were either afraid that if they were committing fraud um, that they would face penalties for it. I think there would have been less fraud. And I think if people thought that risky behavior um, was something that could have an impact on them individually, even if they got their bonus and ran away, if there was a way to claw that money back, for example, I think the behavior would be different. So I think it's really important that there be consequences, whether it's a financial consequence, like that bonus you got two years ago, we're going to claw it back because you oversee illegal acts or prison time. So since almost nobody went to prison, did the culture actually change? Well, I'm not there anymore, so it's hard for me to speak directly. I mean, I certainly talk to folks, my you know old colleagues. I, I don't get the impression that much changed. Um, I do know that they do spend more time doing what's called compliance, which is obeying the law, essentially, and making sure that everything that they do is adheres to the letter of the law. Um, when I was there, the, the, the people who did that role, the compliance role, were ignored. We would schedule meetings with the traders and the sales team and the compliance team, and they would cancel them, cancel them, cancel the meetings, because, ha, ah, who cares about that? Um, I hear from my old colleagues that, that that happens less now, but I don't get an overarching sense that the culture of risk-taking um, has changed. And certainly this Wells Fargo example, all of that behavior happened after the financial crisis. And there's been lots and lots of other investigations into bad conduct that happened after the financial crisis, including um, things like rigging the electricity market in California or doing these crazy risky... Um, there was this big blow up at J.P. Morgan called the London Whale. There's been a lot of bad behavior since, so I'm not convinced the culture has changed. So... Are there any, like, <clears throat> after elections, mm -hmm. is there, a, what kind of financial reforms do you guys want to see? So we're focused on two things that, believe it or not, appeared on both of the parties' um, platforms or have been talked about by both of the parties' candidates. So one of them is about bringing back a really old law that was around in the 1930s here in the United States called Glass-Steagall that basically says if you're going to do risky casino style banking, which we call investment banking, that's fine, but do it in a separate bank that just does that. And if you want to do the more boring, you know, savings accounts, checking accounts, loans to people who want to get a you know, mortgage loans, You can do that, but it also has to be in a separate institution. So the boring banking and the casino banking have to be separate. That was a law that came about in the 1930s after a different financial crisis in the 20s, hmm. caused the Great Depression. Um, and it was around for decades, and there were not that many banking crises. So in the Republicans' platform and in the Democrats' platform, they both call for bringing back a modernized version of this bill, the Glass-Steagall bill. So that's something that we're hoping, hey, Congress, it's in both of your platforms. This is something we agree on. When do we ever agree on anything? So that's one thing um, Americans for Financial Reform is pursuing now and will be pursuing after the election. And then the other thing is a tax issue, a long-standing, really unfair tax loophole here in the U.S. There are these firms called private equity, and basically the way they pay themselves is... If you want to invest, say I'm a private equity manager, you want to invest with me, I charge you 2% a year just for the right to invest with me because I'm so smart. And then I get to take 20% of the profits that I make for you every year. And because of the way our tax code is written, that 20% that the private equity fund manager takes is taxed at a lower rate than teachers pay on their taxes, than firefighters, um, because it's considered an investment and it's considered a capital gain, and that is taxed at a, usually a 20% rate. Whereas if I were, you know, if the private equity fund manager were taxed 
as if that was an income or a salary, it would be much, much higher because these people tend to be millionaires. So it would be in the 30%, for right. example. So this is something that people have talked about changing for a really long time. It's never actually happened, but both of the presidential candidates have said that they want it changed. So again, how often do we have agreement um, in the United States <laughs> in the two major parties? Not that often. So we're hoping for some momentum. And, and that the technical term for that is the carried interest loophole. So we're hoping to actually finally, once and for all, close the carried interest loophole. So you're saying uh, both candidates agree? Or both both parties agree? Didn't well, both? I don't know if both parties oh. agree, but both candidates have said that we should close the carried interest loophole. And there are certainly, um, it's pretty, I think, universally accepted that the Democrats want to close the loophole, but there are a, a number of Republicans who have said that they want to close it as well. Um, some of them are in tough congressional races, so that may have something to do with it. Um, but Donald Trump has said that he wants to close it. Hillary Clinton has said that she wants to close it. And look, they're the top of both tickets for both parties. So we think that's significant and we're hoping that that can translate into actual action. So is that different to 2008 and 2012? Yes. Um, in 2012, so Mitt Romney used to work at a private equity company and he certainly was not in favor of closing that loophole. I think he has a lot of friends that would be upset if that loophole was closed because they pay a really nice low tax rate right now. Um, he paid a very nice low tax rate because of that loophole. He still pays it. He still pays a very nice low tax rate because of that loophole. Because he's still, that, all those all that work he did for Bain Capital, he still probably is making money off of those um, investments. Um, and then in 2008, um, I, I, this was, again, not something that John McCain, for example, said, yes, I want to get out there and close these tax loopholes. Um, it's generally the position of the Republican Party here in the U.S. to cut taxes, not not raise them. And this would affect be a, a, uh, a raise of the taxes of millionaires and billionaires. Um, but even that is generally unpopular um, in the sort of right conservative portion of the American political apparatus. But I mean, we went to a Trump rally. I didn't hear any uh, any of Trump's positions that he said, okay, we're going to raise the taxes on the right. on the millionaires and billionaires. He just said, we're going to raise, uh, no, we're going to lower taxes on everybody. Right, right. Well, he, he has mentioned carried interest a couple times, and it came up in one of the presidential debates. Um, and he talked about it for a while, and it was, I believe, unprompted by the moderator. So I don't, I suppose it's maybe not the kind of thing, I don't know why he would talk about it in a debate and not a rally, but I think... Um, I don't think, I don't know that Donald Trump necessarily <laughs> plans what he's going to say all the time. Um, it's been an interesting election year <laughs> for us here. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think we are hopeful that this is an issue that is increasingly difficult to defend because there are very few people who are willing to get out there and say, no, millionaires and billionaires should pay lower taxes than people who are kindergarten teachers. I want to come back to the regulators. Uh, who are these regulators that uh, work at SEC? Are these former bankers or are these people who have never worked at a bank? They, they, don't wanna, they, don't, they, want, they don't ever want to work for a bank? Are they truly independent? It's a combination. I mean, it's a very big agency. There's a lot of people that work there. Some of them are former bankers. Some of them are lawyers that have worked in, say, in Congress for a member of Congress or worked at other regulators. Um, it really depends. And I think the the way that it's run is it's run by a commission, in theory, of five different commissioners. And it depends on who is the president. Are they a Democrat or a Republican? The president gets to pick um, who has the majority, essentially. So if there's a Democratic president, there's three Democratic commissioners and two Republicans. And so there's, they try to have some balance, but they tip the favor depending on who the president is. And um, there's a commissioner right now, for example, Commissioner Kara Stein. She has, as far as I know, never um, worked at a bank. She may have worked in the private sector a bit, but she used to work in Congress as a staffer. And so it just depends. There's a mix of folks. Um, yeah. So, I mean, Obama has been in office for eight years. Yep. Why didn't he's a Democrat? Why didn't they, I mean, they, they uh, changed some stuff. They uh, founded a new agency. But as you said, it's... Banks are still problematic. Mm -hmm. uh, is it like, couldn't he change so much because there's a, rep, rep, a Republican majority in Congress? That's part of it. Um, I think another part of it is that some of the 
So there was an interesting news story, I guess, a year or two ago about one of the banking regulators called the Fed. Um, And it was someone had done, her name is, uh, I'm blanking on her name, but she had secretly recorded some conversations with some of her colleagues. And there's just this kind of overarching culture where they don't want to go too hard and they don't want to essentially make the banks look bad sometimes. And part of that has to do with the fact that their colleagues, right, their former colleagues, So part of it, I think, is a cultural problem at the regulators, and you need to bring in some people who have a really strong public interest focus to lead those regulatory agencies. Um, But I do think that the point you raise is important. There are certainly reforms that I think the Obama administration would have liked to have passed that were obstructed by a Republican Congress. Um, So I think it's a combination of problems. I read a lot that that regulators or, or that banks write their own regulations. Is that true? There is one very good example of that. Um, so we don't know. So maybe it's perhaps better to say they write their own laws, because um, I think there is an example from Citigroup from a few years ago where there was essentially a bill that was changing a part of Dodd Frank to weaken it, and it was found by the New York Times that um, a lobbyist for Citigroup had written 70 out of 85 lines of the bill. Um, I guess they change 15 lines of it a little bit and that is a bill that passed um, the house and it is a bill that was snuck into a year-end spending bill to fund the government that did eventually pass and was signed into law by Obama um, because he wanted to fund the government essentially but there was a huge fight about it and Citigroup did actually it was shown by the New York Times write that law so that does happen sometimes and it's very interesting because Citigroup is one of the banks that received more assistance from the government than anyone else um, essentially half a trillion dollars in in assistance, um, not just the bailout, not just the TARP bailout, but all of the emergency lending that the Fed gave to them and other programs like that. So it seems it's very interesting the way things work in Washington. You would think if, you know, you had to be <laughs> rescued and someone handed you a half a trillion dollars because you were in so much trouble, you needed that much money that maybe they wouldn't take your phone calls anymore. But um, that's not how it works. <laughs> Do you think uh, the next crash is just a matter of time? I do worry about that. I worry about student debt, for example, in particular, and I'm not the only one worrying about it. The Fed actually has warned that there are a number of younger Americans who are not buying houses or, or taking out mortgages um, to buy houses because of excessive student debt. I think there are some concerns. There's a lot of shady behavior in loans for cars, auto loans. Um, so there's a separate problem just about discrimination, like if you're single, if you're um, black, if you're Hispanic, you get higher rates than if you're white. Um, so that's a separate problem that Why? Uh, I guess the, the car lenders see, first of all, they can get away with it. They think they can get away with it. That's usually the answer to most reasons why people overcharge folks, but I think um, they make an assumption about people that they are higher risk, which is usually totally uninformed. Mm. Um, and then they use that to decide what kind of a rate that they're going to give them. And this is a problem that's been happening for a really long time. That new agency that I mentioned has been trying to combat it. And there are actually some people in Congress trying to get in the way of the CFPB's ability to fight discrimination in auto lending. So that's that's one problem. But then there's another problem, just that there's a lot of Um, loans being given out, auto loans that are considered subprime, and if that word sounds familiar, it should because it was subprime mortgages that caused the last financial crisis. Now, I don't think that loans for cars are going to tank the whole economy, but there's sort of pockets of problems that I see. Student loans is a is a very large problem. I think there are, there's a pocket of problems with car loans. And then there's also problems where some of those private equity companies that I mentioned before, they're buying up homes. So they had all this money after the financial crisis, and now they're buying up homes, and now they're turning them into rentals, and they are securitizing them, which is the same thing they did in the financial before the financial crisis, but they securitized homes that people owned. Now they're securitizing homes that, or sorry, yeah, homes that people rent which is in some ways even more dangerous than securitizing a home that someone owns because you know that the same person in theory is going to stay there for many years. Renters, they could leave next year. What if they fall behind on their payments? Um, 
Do you have to evict them right away? That's really bad for renters. So there's a lot of different pockets of problems that I see um, in our economy currently that make me nervous. Uh, in the end, I wanted to talk about the Occupy movement. Yeah. You've been active in it. Yes. Can you tell us how? Well, so when I quit my job on Wall Street um, in 2010, the next year, I, I was still living in New York and Occupy happened and I remember looking at it very skeptically. But um, I started going down there to the park every day and I got hooked. I mean, it was so different than the way that I was used to operating with very rigid rules and very clear, this person reports to this person, reports to this person, and you got to listen to them. This was this experiment in how do we be totally non-hierarchical. And I was involved with a group called Occupy the SEC, and we wrote a very, very long comment letter trying to suggest changes to a new regulation called the Volcker Rule. Um, did, so, did it work out? So it, it is now in place when we got some, some good changes to make it stronger, but I think we have a lot of open questions about whether it's actually being enforced and whether the banks are actually obeying the new rules. And we've been asking the regulators for some more data so we can evaluate whether or not it's working. And so far we haven't been very successful in, in getting that transparency. So those short answers, we're not sure. Um, but um, we were very happy that the rule was strengthened a bit from the proposal to the final final rule. Um, and then Occupy was sort of dismantled, I think, by a crackdown, coordinated crackdown by different police agencies across the country. Um, New York was certainly kicked out by the police pretty aggressively. But then a bunch of things happened in the wake of it. So the next year after Occupy was sort of over, um, the encampments, I mean, there was a very large hurricane in New York City called Hurricane Sandy. And all of these people that had met through Occupy and either had the skills already or learned new skills through Occupy started forming these little hubs all through Brooklyn and actually created a registry on Amazon.com. But instead of it being like a wedding registry or a baby shower registry, it was, we need diapers. We need, you know... Um, food and canned food for all of these people who lost power, who weren't able to go anywhere because they were out in the sort of far reaches of this area called the Rockaways. Um, and it was all flooded and they couldn't get anywhere. And so all of these people from all over the country and probably all over the world were ordering all of these necessary emergency supplies um, and then delivering them to these hubs, which all of these folks from Occupy set up. And it was called Occupy Sandy. And there's been a lot of news reporting here in the US in the years since about how Occupy Sandy filled some of the holes left by some of the regulatory agencies. Like we have a regulator called FEMA, which is um, supposed to be the emergency manager. And there's been some reporting about how Occupy Sandy in some places was doing the job better than, than FEMA was doing it. Which is unfortunate. You shouldn't. It shouldn't have to be a number of volunteers coming and stepping in. But it was a really interesting and effective, I think, deployment of people who had either met during Occupy or learned some interesting skills during Occupy to respond to like an actual emergency. And so that was something that I helped with. I was. Uh, they called it the driver dispatch, but I basically had a spreadsheet and people would come in and say, I want to go to the Rockways. I want to load up my truck with all of this food and supplies and tell me where to go. And I would make some calls to people who were there who were, you know, either local organizers at their churches or community folks who knew where supplies needed to go. And, and I would say, what do you need? And they would say, we need hot food or we need, um, you know, we need salt or we need whatever. And we would tell people what to load up their car with, tell them where to go and send them on their way. And so it was kind of like, it was like UPS or something. It was, which is a, I don't know if your, yeah. your viewers know, it's like a company that delivers. Yeah. yeah. Um, but it was a really interesting experience. And I think there are a lot of examples like that of like people who either learn things during Occupy or met during Occupy going on and doing other things. I like to call it the Occupy diaspora. Um, but lots of new co-ops formed um, in New York City. I have a friend who was a long time person that worked with co-ops and there was only some 20 some co-ops in New York City before Occupy and a lot of people that were involved in Occupy went off and formed new co-ops so now there's a more than 60. So it's things, oh. <laughs> things like that. Don't it's, blow away. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, do you think Occupy could revive if after the elections nothing happened? I mean, I think it's evolved is what's happened. I mean, I think 
lots of people came together in Occupy that had lots of different interests. Like some people were interested in $15 an hour, fight for 15, worker organizing. Some people were interested in immigrant rights and uh, the rights of the undocumented. And I think after Occupy was sort of cracked down on by the police, people scattered into their different groups. And so I guess the question is, is there another thing in another moment will, that will cause all of these people to stop working just on their specific issue and come back together? And right now, I think everyone is busy working on, you know, stopping the pipeline in North Dakota. Uh, there was a lot of people from Occupy that tried to work on stopping the Keystone XL pipeline, and they were successful in doing that, which is amazing. Um, but I think it would take a, a moment in time, like a crisis of some sort, I think, to bring everybody together. But the thing is, we know how to get back, right? We know the way to... <laughs> to Zuccotti Square. So. so you said uh, repeatedly that police cracked down on Occupy. Mm -hmm. Were you criminals? No, I mean, it's a really good question. Why, why did they feel the need? I mean, I think they tried to make excuses like it was a safety hazard, having all those tents in one place or something like that. But, you know, people line up in tents to go buy a new iPhone sometimes when there's a brand new iPhone launching and the, no one seems to complain about it being a health or safety hazard there. It was about consuming. Right, right. Yeah, no, I mean, they came in and they blocked everybody out. I wasn't there the night of the eviction, but destroyed all the tents. A lot of people lost their property. Um, and it's, it happened all over the country in lots of different places. So now you work for an organization called? Americans for Financial Reform. We're a coalition of about 200 different organizations. Some of them are religious groups, some of them are labor groups, some of them are advocacy groups. And it's sort of like... We don't have the money and the lobbyists that Wall Street has, so we all sort of try to work together and um, use our limited resources and pull them together, decide on what our policy position is across all those 200 groups, which, as you might imagine, is not an easy thing to do to come to consensus, but it's something I did learn in Occupy. How do you get a group of folks to argue through issues and try to come to consensus as a group? So that's what we, we try to do. We try to be the counterbalance to all of the Wall Street lobbyists. There are very few of us, but but we try. <laughs> Alexis, thank you so much. Uh, yeah. Tell our viewers, uh, you, have a, you have one or two podcasts, right? Yes. Um, so the one that I'm most frequently working on right now is called Humorless Queers. Um, it's me and another queer person. So that's a sort of a joke about how sometimes people tease the queer community for being humorless. So um, we try to be, we try to talk about depressing things in a way that doesn't make you too depressed. To try, we try to have some humor, we try to make some jokes, so we talk about mass surveillance and Wall Street issues, which seem very serious, but we try to make them accessible and not too depressing. And I also like your website, Be what is it called? Because, oh, because finance, finance is boring, yeah. yeah. I, 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 Check it out. <laughs> I, try, I used to try to put a lot of cat photos on stories about <laughs> financial news to try to make it a little bit less boring. Do you, do you think financial news are um, intendedly boring? Sometimes, yeah. I think if you can make things complicated or boring, then people will let you get away with stuff because it's like, oh, I can't understand that. If, if you say so, I'll sign here. I guess that sounds like a good rate for my mortgage. <laughs> Just bury it in the fine print, yeah. Alexis, thank you so much yeah, thank you for, for taking me. the time. Bye. <laughs>